Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the indescribable Robert Mack. Hello, Americans. And lucky foreigners visiting our proud lands. Hi. I'm semi-successful non-celebrity Robert Mack from robertmack.com. I know what you're all thinking. Hey, who canceled? I was here a couple years ago. Who remembers? <laughs> Me either. Last time I was here, I was telling a story and I ran out of time. So I thought I'd finish it now. Get it out real quick here. <clears throat> and that's why it's called Lake Titicaca. <laughs> the end. Sorry about the cliffhanger, but uh, you know you want to hear that one again. I come from a large family, a homo sapien. Any others? Oh. Wow. A bunch of homos. I, I took the 23andMe uh, DNA test, and I'm uh, mostly Polish and other Eastern European, and then some other European, and uh, a little bit of Native American, and I'm 1.3% Jeff Goldblum. I'm a big fan of science. I follow it religiously. <laughs> and the, the famous science man Charles Darwin once told me <laughs> that humans and all, all creatures, we have the same biological drive. It's uh, to survive and then propagate the species. And if you've ever been to an airport or tried to park at a Trader Joe's, you've probably noticed there are a lot of us. We are one of the successfulest propagators on the earth. <laughs> so much so now that we're, we're choking the planet, which we need to live. We're not done with the lease yet. And I don't think we're gonna get our deposit back because <laughs> Global warming is out of control, but I have a great idea on how to fix it. Everybody needs to run their air conditioner all the time with their windows open. It's a no-brainer, which is how I thought of it. When you're hot, you turn on the air. When the planet's hot, doy, just turn on the air. What could be obviouser than that? I got the idea when I saw a cat go from the sun to the shade, yeah, when hot, add cold. You'll be less hot. I don't know what part of that flow chart is tripping all you guys up, but even Mr. Pickles has it figured out, all right? It's, it's not rocket surgery, okay? It's a button. It's, you know what's great about our leaders in Washington? Me either. It's all talk and no action. It's not, uh, Oh, greenhouse gases I'm worried about. It's those White House gas bags because all their hot air is only making the globe even warmer. So now we got a big problem and a whole bunch of complainers, but only one thinker. Moy. I'm a problem thinker. I've got a problem thinking right now. It's called Operation Chill Off, which is what everyone needs to do. Just chill off. That's what my mom, Pat, Oh, he says to me because sometimes it gets too hot in the basement for me to sleep, but I didn't come here tonight to talk about Pat because she's not the boss of me right now. I came here to share great ideas on how to lower temperatures around the world. Here's one, convert to the metric system. When we convert to the metric system, temperatures will drop 50 degrees overnight. Fact, that's a scientific fact. Convert, drop, 50 degrees, instant global colding. Oh, they got the metric system in Scandinavia, it's not hot there, is that magic? No, it's metric, 
and I know the difference. I love magic ever since I was a little kid and my dad disappeared. <laughs> Abracadab gone, just like that. <laughs> but I didn't come here tonight to talk about Rick, all right? And I know what you're thinking, sir. You're thinking, I don't want to convert to the metric system because then we'll have a bunch of metricans come into our land. <laughs> Well, then you're a measurist and you need to chill off because once you go metric, you won't go back. Am I right, ladies? What are you gonna do to stop them? Build a wall, a wall 1,100 kilometers wide and like nine gallons tall? Well, who, who do you think's gonna measure that wall? You are with your yardstick? No way, Josef. A metrican is. Well, you're totally digressing the subject, Mr. Interrupter. The problem <laughs> isn't metricans, it's global warming, and we need to save the planet so we can have a place to live. Hola. <laughs> and I have a great idea for that, all right? If you, if you see someone who uh, doesn't recycle or uh, they keep the water on while they're brushing their teeth or um, they leave all the lights on their house w when they leave, if you see someone who does that, just uh, don't mate with them. <laughs> and that way we can breed those traits out of the gene pool. Don't mate, don't date, don't uh, fornicate, don't propagate, don't copulate, don't even cop a feel, all right? Because those, <laughs> those jack butts are killing the planet mostly with, with plastic, yeah. Did you know 40% of all plastic is used only once and then it's gone, waste, yeah. That's, it's like a liberal arts degree or something, that's like, <laughs> Whenever I order my uh, ice double decaf uh, butterscotch cappuccino and uh, it comes and there's a little bit of paper at the very top of the straw, I recycle that paper. All right? And then when I'm done, I get the straw and I feed it uh, to baby dolphins. They love them. Yeah. They think they're little burritos, which are the perfect food and they don't have hands. So that's the closest, th I, and I know, all right, I know about burritos. I grew up outside Detroit in a little town called Tucson, Arizona. <laughs> which is like burrito headquarters, but now there's all these artisanal places like LL Bean Burrito Company, and you have to get the Portobello Burrito, which are these condescending mushrooms that are marinated in white wine and then reduced with black beans and goat cheese and fresh cilantro, and then it's pureed and put into a pastry bag and squirted into this organic hand-tossed hoey tortilla on top with a sun-dried tomato white wine butter sauce on the sides of mixed baby green salad, roasted pine nuts and a red pepper vinaigrette and a blue corn polenta with a tequila lime chutney and uh, sprinkled with amaranth and quinoa. Mm, yeah. mm, so good. I know. Yeah. Just the way the Incas had their burritos. <laughs> I had one of those things that um, uh, fancy people have in the morning. Day job. I had a day job and... <laughs> The first thing you have to do when you have a day job is you have to get up early in the morning. And um, that's inconvenient for me because they don't give you a wake up call from the office. Hello, rise and shine. Time to get out of your manjamas and come on down to the office so we could steal your best ideas. No, you have to get up on your own early in the morning. So I had to get this uh, alarm clock. Have you seen these, anyone, Bueller? It's like a regular clock, but it's hooked up with this alarming device. And what it does is it wakes you up abruptly in the morning, which is the best way to get up when you've been unconscious for a third of a day, according to napticians and sleepologists. You don't want to get up gradually. No, you get up like a jackrabbit. Oh, wow. Don't want to miss the rush hour, right? So you get up and you shower and you pee pee and you have some coffee. And for me, that's too many hot liquids at one time. I, 
I don't think that's good for your system to have hot liquids coming in and going out and getting shot at you, but that's what you do. You wake up and it's hot liquid, hot liquid, hot liquid. And then <laughs> you go outside and it's unbelievable how many people are outside in the morning time. You wouldn't believe how unbelievable it is. <laughs> believe me. I would guess like 50% or maybe even as many as half of all the people <laughs> are up in the morning and they don't, they're not all sparkly face about it, right? There, there's a, a million people there, they're all trying to get over here and there's a million people here and they're all trying to get over there. It's really not organized well at all. You know, why don't you guys live there and work over there and you guys could live here and work over here. But no, they want to do this Chinese fire drill every morning for three hours. I would, I would take the number nine bus, uh, which I call the Comet because it comes once every 78 years. And, <laughs> because you don't want to be in bed anymore. You can't get any work done there where it's soft and quiet and warm and comfortable and peaceful and mellow. No, you want to get to the place where you don't want to be. That's where you want to be, the place you don't want to go, the office. And I worked in this office, a big office. It was like a, a cube uh, farm. There was a lot of cubicles, but nice, very nice people that you could, uh, you could bring their pets. Some people brought uh, a prairie dog in the, in the morning, and they go, look, there's a prairie dog. And I go, where, where is it? And then they go, there's a prairie dog. And I look around and I... I, I never saw him, but that, that doesn't diminish their experience. And they asked me to, to make some coffee and they said the coffee was the best they've ever had and nobody after that was allowed to make coffee or even go uh, in the, anywhere in the kitchen. So they were really nice to me. But I, I had to stop working there because it's none of your business. But <laughs> now I've got this uh, strange uh, fascination. It, I'm like addicted. Uh, to office supplies at the, I love them, right? At end of last summer, I was at the big office supply place and I'm checking out the staplers because Swingline's got a new model, the 646. It's a little modular desktop thing. But then there's, for the copy room, there's this big Bates 224 XHD extra heavy duty power arm. That thing's a revelation, all right? It's got a, a breech load in the back. You can stick in two clips of the extra long chisel points, which are really good for quarterly reports. And then there's, um, this lock back feature if you need to staple onto something else, like uh, if you're putting up a Bradley Cooper poster on the inside of your cubicle because sometimes maybe you get lost in his eyes. And then there's a little twirly plate in the front that spins around so the staples know whether to come out curled in or splayed out. And I'm, I'm checking it out and then my daughter goes, Dad, Dad, they have left-handed scissors for me. And I'm like, oh yeah, right, the kid. We're supposed to be shopping for school supplies. And so I put down the Bates 224 XHD extra heavy duty power. Arm, and um, she's, on the, she's on the school side. I'm on the office side where they have uh, office furniture and the little fridges that you could hide under your desk. And then the motivational sayings that are etched onto rocks. So there's a bunch of the rocks that say, uh, don't talk to me till I've had my coffee or uh, you're gonna crush it today or um, Work isn't what you should do or what you plan to do. Work is what you do do. And so there's... <laughs> but she's, she's on the... Over in the... She takes me over to the scissors uh, pavilion. It's like scissors as far as the eye can see because of the back wall, which is non see throughable And... <laughs> and she's... She's a bunch of stuff, but one of them is left-handed. She's left-handed and she says, Dad, they've got these left-handed scissors. And she, there's like four or five pairs out, out of all of these. And she says, and the others don't say they're for anybody. So nobody gets those. So I'm the only one who gets scissors. And I said, well, it doesn't, it really doesn't work that way. You might want to sit down for this, all right? These are all right-handed scissors and they've always been right-handed scissors. And it's been like that for so long that they don't even bother to put right-handed on them. You're lucky to get left-handed scissors. The country's only like 10% left-handed. The country was built by and designed for right-handed people. It's called right privilege and... <laughs> A 
lot, a lot of right-handed people for, for nothing they've done, just the quirk of how they were born have certain advantages that makes things easier for them. And everything's designed to make it easier for right-handed people, like the buttons on the elevators and, and apps and fishing rods and pencil sharpeners and mugs and the writing on pens and voting machines and all of this stuff. And then she's, yeah, and there are, there are even uh, right supremacists. And if they saw... <laughs> They saw your left-handed scissors, they'd get really mad and say, why does she get something special and different? Everyone should be the same. Everyone should be like us, right-handed. And she goes, yeah, I know, because in Africa, at the orphanage where I grew up, in Africa, they made us color and draw with our, our right hands. And you remember that I, I'm from Africa and that I'm black, Dad, right? And I said, yes, obviously, but the audience hasn't figured that out yet. And... And that's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm talking about how your left hand, a person of left. And when, <laughs> when you're a professional communicator, of which being good at, I am one of them guys. <laughs> I share my great ideas with people. And a lot of times my great ideas are so high over people's heads, I'll actually see them roll their eyes upward to try to see my thoughts <laughs> as they <laughs> escape. Beyond. Yeah. The grasp of understanding. And so she's rolling her eyes. And I said, don't roll your eyes. Let's finish. We've got your scissors. What's left? There's only one thing left on the list. Paper. All right, we'll get the O. Oh, it's white paper. And she said, oh, Dad, that's fine. Don't worry, Dad. Uh, Left-handed scissors cuts white paper. Yeah. <laughs> and then I said, yeah, but motivational rock that says you're going to crush this, crush the scissors, another unearned victory, for right privilege, I know. <laughs> I know it says that we're all created equal, but I mean, come on, it's not the bill of lefts, all right? It's the bill of rights. <laughs> I, flew to, um, I flew to England yesterday, and um, <laughs> It was true the first time I told it, okay? And I'm trying to be in the moment to make this story a little bit better for you guys. So listen up, okay? I flew to England. <laughs> and uh, tra traffic was crazy, of course. And uh, the weather, very bleak and cold. And uh, the lines at the museum is really long. And the locals are a little kind of standoffish. And the food is famously bad, but I had... Uh, <laughs> Other than that, I had a pretty good time, except for the things that I could experience through my senses. And <laughs> at one time, England had the, the biggest empire in the world. They, they used to say the sun never sets on the British Empire. And now it's just like, oh, night, night, because it's now it's just, they're just back down to the, and, and that the rumor, which may or may not be true, I call it a trumor, the trumor, <laughs> is they were so busy conquering the world that they never learned how to cook because they would just take over the cuisines of all the other countries. And it's, it's true, I went there and here, here's a little secret of cooking. If you want something to be better, you add something better to it. I mean, it's obvious, you know, chocolate cake, how do you make it better? Chocolate frosting, all right? There are some people, hamburger, bacon, all right? It's very simple. In England, they put vinegar on the food to make the food taste better, to just give you an idea of what, yeah, vinegar. The same vinegar you use to get the hard water deposits off of the tub <laughs> tastes better than the food. Just to give you an idea of what we're starting with. I, I tried something called the full English breakfast, which sounds pretty impressive. They've been serving the same breakfast for 2000 years which is impressive until you realize there have been a lot of culinary advancements <laughs> in the last 2,000 years, like uh, the invention of flavor, for instance. And <laughs> this is what you get with the full English breakfast. A uh, couple eggs, runny side up. All right, whatever. Uh, <laughs> pork and beans at breakfast? Yes, indubitably. More of those, please. More beans, please. Uh, pork sausage or blood sausage. Mm, whichever sounds deliciouser to you at half six. And uh, bacon, but it's not skinny American bacon. It's that thick euro styling plate hogging, energy bogging, artery clogging, baby got back bacon, bacon, baby. 
and one slice of tomato, which tastes like fish. I don't know how it's some kind of fish-ish dish. And on a separate non-cholesterol plate, you get toast. And I thought, well, thank goodness, how can you mess up toast, right? Well, let me count the ways, because over there, it comes out burned, yet cold, and dry, and flavorless, and they cut it into triangles. So really what you have is a plate full of these little Wheaton trowels used to transport the fat and cholesterol from the plate to their gob, which is what they call, that's what they eat every day, eggs and beans and sausage and bacon. And I'm no healthologist, but I don't think you should be starting your day with four foods from the lard group. That's probably not good for your inside. I said, forget that, I'll have some cereal, but every time I ordered Cheerios, the waiter would leave. So. Yes, that's, that, that wasn't everybody. If you could please explain that one to the quiet people. That one's... I travel a lot because I'm better than you. And I just got a free night at a hotel, okay? It's called Comfort Inn, and it really lives up to its name because comfort means a place of peace and well-being. And inn means not, like, incompetent or inept because they're really not ept at the Comfort Inn. How do you get a free night at a hotel? It's easy, get bumped from a flight on Delta. And how do you get bumped from a flight on Delta? Book a flight on Delta. <laughs> I'm planning, I'm, uh, my next trip, I'm going uh, vacation, going to the beach, and uh, I wanted a good book for the beach. I was a writing major. I always wanted to write real bad, and now I can. <laughs> but where I went to school, uh, you had to sell the books back after your class if you wanted to eat. <laughs> so I, I didn't have any of my old books, but I remembered a very funny satire I read called uh, Catch-22. Who's, who's, uh, somebody, okay. Who's, uh, who's seen the movie? Okay, that's all right, this will work, don't worry. Who's, um, who's read the title? Okay, yeah. It's slow in the beginning, but it really picks up after the hyphen. <laughs> anyway, I went to this big membership uh, book place, and I don't know what the clerk's problem was, but I gave him the book, and he said, is that it? And I said, yeah, that's it, Catch-22. Well, I need to see your membership card. Oh, I don't, I don't have a membership card. How do I get one? You have to buy something. Well, I'm buying Catch-22. Now without a membership card. So... <laughs> I didn't get the Catch-22, but... That's right, many of you didn't either. So instead, I got uh, To Kill a Mocking Clerk is what I got. It's in the how-to section. Next to Death of a Salesman. That guy was a real Moby. I'm married, sorry ladies, and confused boys. <laughs> People ask, How did you, what app did you guys use? We, we met the old-fashioned way, I plundered her village. <laughs> um, but but th th this is true, this is a true story. My, my wife is a bicyclist and uh, she was in an accident and, and snapped her femur in the... Yeah, and her hip. Do we have any medical professionals here? Does anyone know any? What do you know about the femur? It's a big bone. It's the biggest bone. They say the only thing worse than a broken femur is a wife with a broken femur. <laughs> Which is what I have. And it's no walk in the park, I'll tell you that, because... For two weeks after the accident, you can't even sit down when you have a wife with broken femur. <laughs> I 
because she's always asking you to get stuff, you know? I need more meds, okay? Take me to the bathroom, all right? And uh, that's the first symptom. Ringing in the ears is the first symptom <laughs> of wife with broken femur. And it goes on and on. Drain the fluid bag and adjust the pillows and I'm ready to eat. And it's good for the quads. That's great. Yeah, that's the only good thing about WBF. <laughs> And I, I run a lot. I ran uh, 10K the other day. And if you don't know how that uh, translates, 10K is almost, it's about, it's a little bit more uh, than 9K, but it's uh, <laughs> less, fewer than 11K. It's almost, it's almost 10K. And I don't want to sound elitist because I'm better than that. but I was on my high school cross country team for five years. <laughs> Basically what you do is you uh, run uh, across the country. That's why it's called Lake Titicaca. <laughs> the end.